Good evening, I'm Dennis Doster, and welcome to Understanding Town Government. Tonight, we will meet Sean Scanlon, our state representative. State representative is the office where town government joins state government. Sean, you've always been a Guilford resident, right? I have, yeah. Okay. And what schooling have you had? So I went through the whole Guilford school systems. I went to Cox, Baldwin, Adams, and the high school. And then uh, following graduation from Guilford High School, I went off to Boston College in uh, Massachusetts. And what drew you to seek the position of state representative? So um, I've always had an interest in public service. My grandfather was a firefighter in New Haven. My father was a police officer. And um, for a long time, I thought I wanted to go into those careers. And in high school, I actually did a book report for a social studies class on a political campaign. And uh, believe it or not, that's what sort of hooked me into <laughs> politics. Uh, I didn't know that I would run at such an early age, but um, I worked uh, for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, and then I went to work for then Congressman, now Senator Chris Murphy, and sort of was doing the behind the scenes work. And when our longtime state representative, Pat Woodlitz, decided to retire, in 2014, I had some conversations with her and some other folks around town and decided that I would throw my hat in the ring. And here I am now about to wrap up my first term as our state rep. Wonderful. And uh, what, it, what problems did you encounter as your, it, in the first month as state representative? Well, you know, Connecticut, as anybody who watches the news knows, it, is facing some pretty significant fiscal challenges. And during, during the two years that I've been there, we've had difficult budget. Uh, deficits that required us to make tough decisions to solve. Um, I would say that that's pretty much the, the hardest thing that we're facing uh, at the state level um, is trying to, to fix that problem and from my perspective get Connecticut back on a track that is going to lead more young people to stay here, uh, allow people to stay here of all generations, uh, bring new business into the state, keep jobs here in the state mm -hmm. of Connecticut, all those kind of things are what I spend a lot of time focused on mm -hmm. because I think that that, at the end of the day, is the most important issue facing the state of Connecticut. Well, let me go back and ask that question again. These are the issues that, that sure. we're facing. But personally, what, uh, what, what did you encounter the first month? I mean, getting used to the sure. position. So one of the things that I, um, I came in with a class of 10 other freshmen yeah. uh, in, the, in the legislature. And um, without sort of tooting my own horn, I think that I had a leg up on a lot of them in a, many different ways, but in one crucial way, which was that in my job working for Senator Chris Murphy, I served as a liaison to state reps and state senators. And so when these men and women would have problems in their district that dealt with the federal government, whether it's they wanted to grant for their towns or they had a constituent who had a problem with Medicare or the VA, they would oftentimes reach out to me uh, and asked me if I could help them have our office help their constituent mm -hmm. or their community. And so I really understood how the process worked and was able to sort of hit the ground running, more so than a lot of people who I think walk in there uh, sometimes shocked yeah. at, the, at the grandeur of the, of the building and the craziness of the legislative process. Um, and I'm fortunate that I did have that experience going in because it allowed me to do things right away that some of my other colleagues were not able to do. And when you become a state representative, you have a staff that helps you, right? That so um, Connecticut is unique in the sense that it's a part-time legislature. So um, okay. we're technically only in session in the odd-numbered years for about six months and in the even-numbered years for about four months. And there are always special sessions that come about, especially with regard to the budget. We've had many of those. Um, but we are truly a part-time legislature, and that also extends to our staff. Um, as a state representative, you share one aide with three other reps. Um, so my aide also helps people that are, represent New Britain and Bridgeport. Um, and I do a lot of it myself. Um, and so when somebody calls me up or somebody sends me an email, if they're having a problem with the state agency, I am very hands-on. And I like to sort of do the work myself to try to solve their problem. I don't typically farm it off to my aide. Um, but he's the kind of guy who answers my phone and checks my mail up in Hartford. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to doing things like constituent work or research, um, a lot of cases I'm doing that on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, fill that out a little bit because yeah. uh, I don't know exactly what what the, what all that means. What uh, what exactly do you do, or can you give some examples? So um, 
you know, a legislator has two primary functions. Right. Um, number one is to represent your constituents, um, their wishes when it comes to legislation, um, and to be their voice in a 151 member House of Representatives. That's my, my job of representing about 30,000 people, not just here in Guilford, but also two neighborhoods over in Brantford. Um, but the second thing, and, and what I like best about this job, is actually helping people um, who are having problems. And I'll give you an example. I'd say that in the year and a half that I've been in office, mm -hmm. um, by far the agency at the state level that I had the most constituent interactions on is the DMV. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how the, the lines of the DMV are very long. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of us over the age of 16 have a driver's license and therefore have to interact with the DMV. Um, and so whether it's having trouble uh, scheduling a road test for their 16-year-old son or daughter, uh, whether it's a, a mistake where they got their insurance, they got a thing in the mail saying that their registration had lapsed, but they had paid the check. Um, I typically will call up the DMV commissioner's office on behalf mm -hmm. of my constituent and say, hey, you know, this seems a little weird. Is there anything we can do here? Mm -hmm. um, and typically I can get an answer faster, unfortunately, than if you had went to the old Saybrook DMV and stood in line for five or six hours sure. to ask a question. So um, I love doing that part of the job and the constituent service stuff is the, by far the most rewarding. Um, but legislating and serving your district are the two primary functions of what I believe a state legislator should be doing. How do you research these things? What do you do? So um, when it comes to legislation, when it you comes mean? to legislation, yes. So I serve on three committees, Dennis. I serve on the Public Health Committee, Transportation, mm -hmm. and Environment. Mm -hmm. And each of those three committees has staff um, that do brief us on certain issues. But I got to tell you that in my brief experience, by far the most I ever learn is from people either in my district or across the state who are actually experts with this, um, with the particular field that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, I'll give you a great example. For um, the last year and a half, I've dedicated probably most of my time in the legislature to working on the issue of heroin and prescription drug abuse. Yeah. And I started off at a meeting with the Guilford Day uh, group, which is a group of students and parents here in Guilford that are fighting in our high school uh, to make young people aware that there are alternatives to doing drugs and drinking alcohol. Um, and what they told me at this very first meeting I did in November of 2014, right after I won, was that they were alarmed by the rise of prescription drug abuse at GHS. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sort of got to the legislature in January of 2015 and realized that there was nobody else really talking about this issue. Um, and since I was on the committee public health that was cognizant for addiction, uh, I decided to just learn everything I possibly could about this issue. And that meant talking to parents, it meant talking to students, it meant talking to doctors, mm -hmm. first responders, police officers. Um, and at the end of that process, I put together a piece of legislation that was signed into law in 2015, and then another one this year that's even more comprehensive than the 2015 one. All of that came as a result, not of me having necessarily a staffer, it's m putting in the legwork to realize what should be going into bills and what shouldn't be going into bills, and then having to go to your colleagues all 150 mm -hmm. of the other ones, uh -huh. and convincing them that this is the right approach to do this. Uh, it takes a lot of work, but it's worth Would it. Would you call them up? Do you go around to their offices? What do you do? Yeah, so you know, the first step, obviously, and we can talk more about how a bill becomes a law in Connecticut and do our own schoolhouse yeah, yeah. rock type thing, yeah. but um, primarily everything starts uh, at the committee level. Um, and the Public Health Committee is about 25 to 30 legislators, Democrats and Republicans from all over the state. Um, and passing any sort of bill to get to the floor of the House and the Senate and ultimately the governor's mm -hmm. desk requires it to be passed in a committee that's relevant to the issue. And so the first step is always convincing your 24, 25 other colleagues on a committee that you're on to pass a piece of legislation. Uh, and once you can get that done and it moves to the next level of the House, that's when you then begin to grab people on the floor. Well talk you have to, to come, it, you, let's say you have a piece of legislation that sure. you want to put through. You first go to this committee. Yeah. And first of all, you got to get them to even listen to it, sure. right? Yeah. Yes. And then you, you discuss the value of it. Do the other committee members help you at all? On sure. It? Well, you know, when talking about this specific issue, yeah. um, there is not a legislative colleague that I have in any town in the state that has not had an opioid or a heroin overdose in their district. Um, this is an epidemic that now kills more people in the state of Connecticut than car accidents. Um, and so all of my colleagues were getting calls and emails from their own constituents saying, my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife died yeah. of this tragedy. 
um, and we have to do something about this. You need to do something about this. And um, somebody once gave me a little bit of, of good advice when I was heading to the legislature that said, don't try to learn everything about every issue because you never will have the time or the experience to do that. You should pick a few different issues and really master them. Mm -hmm. And that way, when those issues come up, your colleagues will know to come to you uh, and you can help educate them about this. And you'll you can, be the expert. You can be the expert on yeah. this. And so, um, like I said, when I got to the legislature, I realized that nobody else was really taking this issue on. And I sort of went to the chair of the committee and said, do you mind if I sort of take this under my, my arm here and carry the football for our committee? And they said, by all means, go ahead. And that's exactly what I've, I've done. Do you have any, uh, having done all this research, do you have any insight into why all of a sudden this, uh, is it just that we're getting more attention on this issue or is it that that something has happened in society to turn more people to what we know is a highly addictive drug? So the, the there's a lot of things that go into this obviously, but um, from the 1990s on, um, when these sort of drugs like Oxycontin, Vicodin, became more prevalent in our society to treat pain of people, uh, and these drugs came out of the market, pharmacists and doctors were writing tens of millions of these prescriptions every single year. Um, now, there are legitimate needs to these drugs, and there are legitimate uses to these drugs, um, but the problem was that as a society, we became so uh, used to just asking the doctor for a prescription and over-prescribing that we ended up with a massive amount of excess in our society of these unused pills that were sitting in medicine cabinets all across the state of Connecticut, including in towns like Guilford. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have people beginning to experiment with them, these drugs are very, very powerful. And we have gotten to a point in our society where four in five new users of heroin begin with prescription drug pills that they find 50% of people who begin to misuse these drugs get them from a friend or a family member, oftentimes very innocently. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you have this rash of this, this excess of supply and you have people trying to find that excess, you, f you get to where we're at today. Um, as I said, more people today die of, car of drug overdoses in Connecticut from heroin and opioids, which are prescription drugs, than they do from car accidents. And this year, we're on course to have even more deaths than we did in 2015. Um, two people in the state of Connecticut overdose and die from these drugs every single day, every day. Um, and so what I did in the bill in 2016 was try to attack the premise of our problem, which is this excess. Um, and my colleagues and I decided that uh, at the advice of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, earlier this year, they suggested that we limit the amount of prescriptions that we give out to people for acute pain which is when you get your wisdom teeth out, when you have a minor surgery, when you remove uh, you know, a, a small polyp or something on your arm, um, typically these doctors were sending people home with 50 or 60 pills wow. when they were only gonna use five or six until they felt better. And then that excess would go in their medicine cabinet and stay there typically for a very long time because most people don't know how to get rid of them. So what we did is very simple. We said that for now on, we were gonna limit the prescription that an adult could get for the first time of these powerful drugs to seven days. And we exempted very clearly people who have chronic illnesses, chronic pain, um, because they really do need these drugs. But mm -hmm. if you were a teenager getting your wisdom teeth out, no longer were you gonna be able to get a big supply because we believe, and the CDC believes, and doctors believe, that this is the main cause of this problem. Um, the bill that I uh, shepherded through this year and helped write passed unanimously. It had the support of the doctors groups. That was not easy to get done, but at the end of the day, we did our homework and we found a finished product that was actually gonna help people uh, rather than hurt people. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that what was happening is these uh, kids that were getting these large prescriptions were then taking a few of them and giving them out at school. Yeah, giving, giving them out at school. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the most shocking thing, Dennis, that, that somebody said to me at that very first meeting at Guilford Day, which was in November of mm -hmm. 2014, right after I got elected, they said to me, most of my friends don't think these drugs are bad for you because if they think that my grandma is taking them or my grandpa is mm -hmm. taking them or a father is taking them, how could I as a young, strapping 16, 17 year old get hurt by this? Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing when you look at cigarette smoking. Um, when you ask these kids if they smoke cigarettes, they said it's disgusting. Why would they ever smoke cigarettes? And yeah. that's because they think that those are bad for you. Mm -hmm. um, they don't think these pills are bad for them. And just taking a few of them, these pills are that powerful that addiction 
can happen overnight. Um, and the young people who are dying of this are not the kind of kids that you think of usually when you associate drug addiction with people. These are the valedictorians of high schools. These are star athletes and prom queens and prom kings um, who develop these very powerful addictions overnight and their life quickly spirals to the point that they can't control it and oftentimes they pass away from it. Now, we've gotten to the point where getting the bill passed yeah. is in committee, and the committee listens to it, and then they like it when it's finished. Yeah. They vote it to present it to the whole house. Sure. Uh, and it goes on a schedule. Is that how it works? So um, whenever any bill passes the committee process in the legislature, mm -hmm. which is typically what we do for the first two or three months, very different than Washington. Mm -hmm. Washington... Um, you can pass bills in committee and then put them on the floor 12 months a year. In Connecticut, because we have such a constricted timeline, we start with the committees and it sort of builds up from there. And so uh, in any given year, you could have three or 4,000 bills getting passed or being introduced at the committee level. Um, a couple thousand of them will pass. And then we typically only pass a couple hundred in the main chamber. So once you get it passed in the committee, that, then it becomes incumbent on you to go to the Speaker of the House and lobby him or her to call your bill on I the see. floor of the legislature and get it on that main list that's going to then be debated that day. That takes a lot of work. Um, but again, on an issue like this, especially if it's a bipartisan issue, which I've tried to make mm -hmm. most of the work that I'm doing in Hartford bipartisan, um, you have a lot of people asking the speaker to call the bill, and your job becomes a lot easier. Yes. Could, can the speaker, could the speaker conceivably never bring a bill forward? Yeah, that happens very, very often, especially on uh -huh. controversial issues. Um, if he thinks that uh, a vote won't pass, if the votes aren't there to bring mm -hmm. the bill up, we have a rule typically that we never bring a bill to the floor if it's not assured of passage um, because it typically takes a lot of time. And by the Constitution, we're mandated to leave that building at a certain time, at mm -hmm. midnight on the first Wednesday of either May or June, depending on what year it is. We have to be done with all our business. And so if there's a bill that's not assured of passage, it could take five, six, seven, eight hours of debate in which we could have passed seven, eight, nine, ten bills that were priorities for Democrats and Republicans for their districts. Uh, we'd be wasting it on a bill that might not pass. And mm -hmm. so uh, the speaker has a very difficult job, but one of the difficult positions he's in is always picking whether a bill can actually get passed or not. And so if you had preparation and you weren't complete by the end of the the term you'd have to start all over because yeah. you have a new house right it's not the same people anymore it's like cinderella uh when yeah. the clock strikes the thing dies and you have to start all over again so you have to go from the beginning of process from introducing the bill to passing it to the committee to going to the house the senate the governor um, everything begins anew once the clock hits midnight now wh uh, wh wh what's the pay for state representative so the pay is about $25,000 a year. Um, almost all of my colleagues have an outside job. Yeah, that's uh, truly a part-time It's truly salary. a part-time uh, yeah. part thing. Um, and, you know, we're in there for half of the year in the building. Um, but I consider this essentially a full-time job in the sense that, um, you know, constituents are calling and emailing me and uh, 12 months a year, there's things that can be done in the district all the time. Um, so we may be in legislature time, part-time, um, but it's a full year-round position. And so $25,000 a year is sure. not really enough to survive on very sure. well. So what are you doing the rest of the time? So I still, you know, I work, as I said, I worked for Chris Murphy, the senator, for seven years before I got elected, and I still work part-time for him to sort of supplement the, the income and, um, you know, People aren't too fond of politicians uh, right now in our in our culture, and understandably so. They're very it's a very frustrating uh, field, and politicians can be very frustrating. So there's people that always talk about the fact that we should become a full-time legislature and pay people more. I don't think that's in the cards. Um, but what I will say is that uh, there aren't a lot of people in the legislature who look like me. Um, I'm one of the youngest people up mm -hmm. there, um, and I think we sort of self-select who can serve in government based on that, uh, the what we pay, um, because if you're a young person who has a young family, uh, it's very difficult to survive on, right. that, on that salary. If you're a middle class person who wants to just do good for your community, 
um, and you can't afford to have another job because there aren't a lot of people who would hire you to do uh, six months a year of work, uh, it becomes difficult. And I think that that's sort of where we get into the problems. But the idea of a citizen legislature, I think, is a good one inherently. Now, uh, how, so how many hours a week do you put in? You put on, you just work all the time on this? Aren't you doing something else at the same time? Yes, yeah, so I do both at the same time. I mean, right. I have, um, on my iPhone, I get my work email. Yeah. Um, and so typically when a constituent you know, sends me an email, I have it right there on my phone and I try to get back to them as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, on my business cards, since the day I ran for office and to this day, I put my cell phone number on those cards so people can always call and text me if they have problems. Um, and, you know, I may not physically be in my office in the state capitol every single day um, when I'm at my other job, but my aide does, uh, you know, obviously maintain my office and when things arise during the day, we're in constant mm -hmm. communication on a daily basis to learn what's going on or if somebody calls the office looking for help, I'm always going to be there to call them back right away. Okay. Now, you know a lot about the issues that you're... Sure. But what about the other issues? What about the issues that are brought up by other representatives? Sure. Uh, and they must be compete. That must be competing for your time sure. to study what what other people are bringing up, and sure. then you're not on that committee. Sure. So what do you do? So it becomes challenging, um, and that's where you have to rely on friends, and that's why it's important to have friends on both sides of the aisle, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. It's really important because when you see somebody come up and they call a bill on for the legislature. You see who sponsored the bill and who's really pushing for the bill. And if you have a good relationship with him or her, you go over, you talk to him and say, look, I read the bill, uh, I reviewed it, but I got a question for you. And typically that person's always going to answer that question. Um, and most of the time you also think about pe to people in your own district who are doing that. So if a farm bill is being debated, for example, uh, I would make some quick calls to the farmers that I know here in the district to say, hey, you know, uh, I just want to run this by you real quickly. Would this have an impact on your business? Would this be a good thing, a bad thing? And you often have to make very quick decisions. Uh, and sometimes you can't necessarily poll your constituents or ask them for advice. And you have to make a judgment call, which can be difficult sometimes. But um, I go up there every day when we're in session and I sort of have a pretty simple rule, which is I'm going to try to do what I think is right, um, regardless of party, um, regardless of the pressure that may be mm -hmm. on me by the leadership of the, of the party. Um, I've taken some votes that the Democratic Party leadership has been unhappy with, and I've done mm -hmm. some things that the Republicans are unhappy with. But at the end of the day, I think that the people of Guilford and Brantford um, want me to go up there and be an independent voice and make my own decisions and not just follow along with the party. How do they pressure all you? All the time. You, yeah. Well, you know, um, listen, I, I am a Democrat. I, I support yeah. the Democratic Party, and I agree with them on most of the issues, which is why I'm a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, but they have an agenda of passing what they view as their agenda is. And whenever there's going to be a vote that's going to be a little close, then the leadership will come and ask you how you're going to vote on that bill. I see. Uh, and if I disagree with them, I have to be up front with them and tell them that. And at that point, um, sometimes you'll see a little bit of the exertion of, mm -hmm. of force from, from the top brass. Um, but Who's the top brass? What do you mean the leadership? The yeah, so the speaker, the speaker of the House okay. um, is the person who oversees the entire House, and then uh -huh. each party has what's called a floor leader, and that's either the majority leader, in our case the Democrats, or the minority leader, and the Republicans. Okay. Uh, that person is sort of like the quarterback of the legislature, and it's their job to round up the troops every time there's a vote and make sure that that vote is going to get passed or killed, depending on mm -hmm. what, they, what they want. Um, and they have a team of people uh, usually referred to as whips in legislative terminology mm -hmm. because back in the day they used to literally have whips that they would crack <laughs> to, to get people to vote for them. That goes back to the British Parliament. Um, and whenever there's going to be a vote, those whips are assigned certain members of the legislature and they go out and tell their team, uh, you know, what the next bill is going to be and that the leadership wants that or doesn't want that. And then you have to sort of, like I said, uh, make a, a, a decision based on what you think is right for your district. Um, so there's where you really have to do sure. some work, because if you're going to disagree with sure. your party, you better have a good reason. Sure. And sometimes sometimes it's a conscience thing, too. Um, sometimes it's not even because I think that a lot of people back home are going to be upset with the way I vote or they mm -hmm. want me to vote a certain way. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes your conscience just tells you what you think is right. Um, and I'm always happy to do what I think is the right thing to do mm -hmm. morally. Um, so 
sometimes when I know that it's maybe the unpopular thing to do politically because I think that the people who elected me elected me in part to, to carry out their wishes, but also I think because they thought that I had the judgment to make those kind of tough decisions at the last minute, um, and that's what our representative democracy is all about. Is there any particular bill you thought was wrong-headed that you could tell us about particularly wrong? Well, you know, I did vote against the state budget in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, was one of 11 Democrats to do so, and that was a very difficult decision to make. Um, you know, that was a, a very contentious budget. It's still contentious to this day, um, where we were having a conversation about taxes, and taxes are obviously never a popular thing to discuss. Um, but I felt that it was the wrong time to be raising taxes on some of these bigger businesses. Um, personally, I'm not opposed to having a fairer tax code. I think that that's certainly something that we should be looking into in the future. Um, do I think it's wrong that a CEO of a big company pays less in taxes than his secretary? Of course. Um, but at this particular m moment in Connecticut's history, um, where we are having trouble recovering from the recession, and we need to do a better job of retaining businesses and growing our businesses, uh, that raising taxes on some of these companies like GE was gonna be problematic and it was gonna have consequences. Um, they have subsequently obviously decided to leave Connecticut and go to mm -hmm. Boston with less of an impact. You know, there's less jobs going there than they originally had talked about. Um, but those kind of things reinforce the uh, idea that Connecticut is bad for business state. Um, we're not. We have a lot to offer, and we have a lot of things going for us here in Connecticut. But at that particular moment, I felt that it was the wrong decision to make. I voted the way I think my constituents wanted and what my conscience told me. Uh, it put me in the minority of my party, but I don't regret that vote. Uh, and I think that I made the right decision given what's happened since then and what we're still facing as a, as a state with regard to the economy. Well, and what happened since then? Well, you know, we, we've just had, uh, you know, GE did decide to leave here. Yeah, okay, um, and, you know, other businesses obviously look at that and say, well, geez, what the heck do we want to go to Connecticut for? Yeah. With that said, Dennis, there is a lot of good things happening here. Um, EB makes our submarines for the entire Navy fleet here, not too far away from here in Groton. They are hiring 1,500 people this year. Uh, manufacturing is coming back. We've had companies coming into the state of Connecticut. It's not all doom and gloom. And the other mm -hmm. side of the aisle, the Republican Party, with all due respect to them, sometimes does act as if the sky is falling here in Connecticut. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we as Democrats and Republicans should come together and find a way that we can work towards the future of Connecticut uh, and come up with solutions to our problems and not just scream at each other back and forth about what's right and what's wrong. Um, I'll give you one example of how I've tried to do that. There are 25 members of the 186 person legislature under the age of 40. Um, and I founded and co-chair a caucus of young legislators from both sides of the aisle. Um, and we're focused on trying to find solutions to big problems that are facing Connecticut because, like it or not, we're going to be the ones that are going to be around uh, longer than other folks mm. dealing with these problems if we don't get a hold of them. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways that we can sort of put aside partisanship and come up with solutions uh, to our big problems that are facing the future of Connecticut um, because I grew up here, like you said. I grew up mm -hmm. in Guilford. I love the state. I want my kids to grow up in a better state than I did. Uh, and I'm confident that we can do that if we work together to find solutions to our problems. How old are you? I'm 29 years old. Uh, well, you're well under 40. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, well, one last question. What You may have already answered this yeah. with the drugs. But yeah. uh, uh, let's try it again anyway. What do you consider to be the most important issues facing the state today and why? Well, I certainly think that that's an important issue, and I've dedicated a ton of my time to it and will continue to do so as, as long as the people of Guilford and Brantford give me the honor to serve them in the House. But uh, I would go back to the economy and jobs. Um, you know, Connecticut regained almost every single job we lost during the Great Recession uh, in 2007, 2008, 2009, um, which is great. Um, the problem is that the jobs that came back post-recession are at lower wages than they were pre-recession. And that's what's causing our budget problems right now because people are paying less income tax than they once were and our budget was made to anticipate that that revenue was gonna come in. It's not. Um, look, the economy is improving. Unemployment is down. There's no question about that. But the average family that I talk to in Guilford and Brantford doesn't necessarily feel that the economy is improving. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon every single one of us that's in the legislature right now or in government in any capacity to go to work every day thinking about how we're gonna improve Connecticut's economy. 
um, because I believe, as JFK used to say, that a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And if we can improve the economy, um, that means that everybody is going to benefit from that, whether it's the guy who owns the deli, it's the Uber driver, it's the small business owner, it's the young person graduating from UConn looking for a job here in Connecticut. If we can get the economy going, uh, we can lift all boats. And that has a big effect because some of the cuts that we have to make to balance our budget without raising taxes are affecting the constituents that I serve. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't go to Hartford to go up there and cut programs that matter to people in their life. That's not what I ran for office for. I ran for office to help people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the ways that I think we can be different uh, is if we together um, come up with bold solutions to create the next generation of Connecticut. That's not going to be a Democrat idea. It's not going to be a Republican idea. It's going to be a collective idea to actually change the way we're operating. And if we can do that and lift those boats, I think that we can really do great things here in Connecticut. And I'm convinced that I can be a part of that. And that's why I'm running again this year. And I obviously uh, hope to have the honor of serving a second term. Now, is there anything that you'd like to add that I haven't asked about? Um, no, you know, I think that I would just say uh, to your audience that um, sometimes government can be daunting, uh, especially state government, more so than town government, just because you know people who are in town government. They're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're people you know. Um, you only have one state rep, you have one state senator. Um, but it's very important to me personally um, that I get feedback from constituents. And if they have questions, that they feel free to ask them. Every month or two, I hold what's called coffee and conversation. I literally go to Dunkin' Donuts, Perk on Church, cilantro. I sit there for an hour uh, and just let people come in and either yell at me, high five me, uh, tell me I'm doing a terrible job, give me an idea that they have, ask me for help with something. Uh, you name it, I just sit there to listen to them because listening, I think, is the most important part of the job. So my message, I guess, to your audience would be that if you have something that you believe is uh, a good idea, if you have a problem, if you have a suggestion or a solution, I am here to listen to you. It's why I give my cell phone number out publicly. It's why I check my email on my iPhone as fast as I possibly can. Um, I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. Uh, I don't have a big staff. And when I get firsthand knowledge of something from somebody who's living this every single day, whether it's the mother of somebody who has a child with an intellectual disability, an unemployed person looking for work, somebody having problems with the state agency, they are living that, and I am not. And But through them, I am able to be their voice in Hartford. And unless I hear from them, my job is a little bit harder because I have to go out and find the answers. So if they can bring the answers to me, it makes it easier, and it makes me a better voice for them in Hartford. Excellent. Excellent. And the purpose of understanding town government is to help bring clarity and transparency to how government works in our town and in the state. Please tune again the next time in which we will explore these issues further. Have a good evening.